Dual monster cards are the vessels of choice for duelists and sorcerers to channel monster spirits and magical effects in epic clashes of wills. They're also trading cards that actual human people collect and trade in real life. In the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series, dual monster cards were created by the mega-rich entrepreneur slash amateur painter Maximilian Pegasus and his company Industrial Illusions. Us real-lifers get cards printed by Konami, but some cards are weird and blur the narrative line between our world and the anime. Yep, this video is going to take a look at a select few normal monsters released from Konami written by plucky, perpetual underdog Joey Wheeler. First, let's talk about the set they released from. Fittingly, the main cards we're going to discuss made their TCG debut on October 11th, 2013 in Legendary Collection 4, Joey's World. Like previous Legendary Collections, Joey's World came with a collapsible game board, some foil promo cards, and five Legendary Collection Joey's World Mega Packs. The promo included copies of Blue Flame Swordsman, Harpy Lady Phoenix Formation, and a Card of Last Wheel, with Card of Last Wheel being illegal to use in competitive play because drawing five cards is crazy. Each box's promo cards also influenced a flock of four scapegoat cheap tokens which anime fans will remember saving Joey countless times, and by countless I mean 10. But that's still a lot of sheep, since the spell Scapegoat summons 4 sheep tokens in defense mode. That's 40 sacrificial lambs between Joey's life point and his opponent's monsters. Although lamb tokens are actually something different, and by happy chance also included in Legendary Collection 4. These lamb tokens were new to the TCG, unlike the sheep tokens which were previously made available as convention exclusives. They were intended for use with the Stray Lamp spell card, which was like Scapegoat, but much worse because it was a normal spell and also locked out of summoning, but not setting, monsters. Unlike Scapegoat, which spent a few years limited to one of the ban lists, going back to Unlimited, then getting stuck at two, and then back to open use, while undergoing six erratas to modulate the power of going plus three off of a quick play spell in the evolving game. The Mega Packs included a wealth of cards used by anime characters, like Joey Wheeler of course, but also cards from notable opponents My Valentine, Merrick Ishtar, Rex Raptor, Bandit Keith, and the Paradox Brothers. They also threw in some Halloweeny cards to fill the rest of the pack, probably because of the October release date, but also could be a reference to Joey's duel against Bonds in the Arena of Lost Souls. But enough context, let's get into the cards. And what better card to start with than Kage Ningen, a level 2 dark warrior with 800 attack and 600 defense. Here's what the card has for its flavor description. He uses both a physical and shadow form to attack, and he's a tough monster to beat. The phonetic spellings are meant to evoke the Brooklyn accent that Joey spoke within the English dub of the Duel Monsters anime. Despite Joey's claims, Kage Negan isn't that tough to beat, but then Joey Wheeler's opponents often underestimated him to their own downfall, so it's fitting to see Joey stick up for the little guy. Most of the cards written in Joey Wheeler's voice hadn't been printed in the TCG before Legendary Collection 4 presenting a good opportunity to add a little bit of pizzazz as they migrated over from the OCG. In Japanese, Kage Nigen is also Kage Nigen, which translates to Shadow Person. Literally, Kage, Shadow, Ningen, Person. Like the rest of these cards, Kage Nigen's OCG flavor text is written in more of a reserved, neutral tone. Skullstalker is another Joey voice monster, with the almost unreadable description, Foist he's gonna grab ya monster with his claws. Den attack again with his pawns and stinga. This Dark Warrior is like Hage Negan, but a little better with an additional level, 100 more attack, and 200 more defense, and establishes the pattern of elongating ER and AR sounds into the wider sound AH. This pattern is both extended and subverted in the description Joey gives for Stone Armadiller. This Stone Crit has got rock hard fur. Dad gives him some really good defense. Interestingly, the interior R presented in rock hard becomes hot, but the deeper you are in fur remains unchanged drawing a Joey voice distinction between er and er, which on paper makes a very similar sound. But back to Stone Armadillo, which is presumably spared becoming Armadillo, because Pegasus or Konami or whoever only unleashed Joey on the flavor tax. This monster is a level 3 earth attribute rock monster with 1800 attack and 1200 defense, meaning it would only be marginally more useful than Skullstalker or Kage Negan except warrior monsters have way more generic support than rock monsters. But good news for Stone Armadillo, if the success of your strategy hinges on the contextual advantages of Skullstalker over Stone Armadillo, then you're probably going to lose anyway, so that doesn't really matter. Let's cut back to Legendary Collection 4 for a second. These foils in these packs included powerful classics like Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, Raigeki, and Pot of Greed. What's noteworthy about the rarity ratios in these mega packs are that pulling a specific common was way harder than pulling a specific secret rare. With 220 total commons in the pool, and 5 included in each mega pack, collecting one copy of Joey's 9 normal monsters is going to be a lot harder than collecting a playset of secret rares like Book of Moon or Solemn Judgment. While these cards aren't particularly rare as collectibles, they are significantly more expensive compared with most of Joey World's commons that aren't in his voice. 
Although they're still not significantly expensive, and a few non-Joey voice TCG exclusive comments from this set do actually cost some dollars. Ultimately, while the Joey voice cards are cool, the cards themselves aren't particularly well liked. At least, not as much as cards that had actual appearances in the anime. Sword Art of Dragon, used by Rex Raptor against Joey in episode 11, is just way cooler than Stone Armadiller, and it has 1750 attack and 2030 defense, which is really fun and silly. Actually, Wheeler's 9, which is just what the Joey voicers are going to be called for the rest of this video, did technically appear in the anime. Kage Negan and Skullstalker were never brought to life by technology or shadow magic, but they were briefly seen in card form during Joey's classroom duel against Yugi in episode 1, and again when Yugi analyzed Joey's deck in episode 2, advising him to experiment with running a single spell or trap card. Interestingly, in episode 13, both of these cards appeared in Yugi's hand during his shadow duel against Yami Bakura, but were ultimately discarded without seeing play by the effect of Morphing Jar. Apparently, Joey didn't draw to Stone Armadiller during his episode 1 duel with Yugi, but it was seen during episodes 2 deck analysis, and again by a random duelist while Kaiba was diligently rifling through ongoing matches in Duelist Kingdom after hacking into Industrial Illusions to find where Yugi was dueling. In episode 2, Joey participated in pre-tournament card trading on the boat to Duelist Kingdom to soup up his deck before the competition. Whether intentional or not, Stone Armadillo's quick appearance during Kaiba's hack is a cool continuity nod that some of Joey's monsters made their way into the decks of other competitors. Too bad none of these anime sightings are as cool as being a giant dinosaur that someone actually summons. Speaking of giant dinosaurs, unfortunately no one ever summons Anthrosaurus in the anime, but this level 3 earth dinosaur does have a thousand attack and 850 defense, making it the strongest Wheeler's 9 representative yet. Here is what the card says. This man-like dinosaur's got a high IQ, even though he's lagging in the strength department. Kinda like yous if you had a high IQ. Yeah. First off, sick burn. Incredible. Here we witness an intriguing linguistic evolution in the words department and dinosaurs. The previous established paradigm which suggests that department be spelled department, but instead the card elects for the more pronounced deployment. On a related note, one might expect the R sound in dinosaur to become dinosaurs, but no, dinosaurs. This monster rocks. It's also canonizing Joey's popular catchphrase of the Yu-Gi-Oh fans, nye. This vocalization, often employed by Joey moments of confusion or consternation, is frequently lampooned in Yu-Gi-Oh fan content across the internet. Pour one out for our boy. And Anthrosaurus isn't the only dinosaur we'll be talking about today. Little D is another level 3 earth dino, but this one has 1100 attack and 700 defense, dethroning Anthrosaurus as the premier attacker of Wheeler's 9. Unlike Anthrosaurus, which was seen in the briefcase of cards Kaiba offered Salamoto in exchange for the fourth and final Blue Eyes White Dragon, and again during Yugi's episode 2 analysis of Joey's deck, and again in Yugi's hand in his shadow duel with Yami Bakura, Little D never appeared in the Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters anime. Instead, this little dude finally got an anime screen credit seven years after its TCG debut, when a character named Khan Hakubutsu briefly brought one out in episode 9 of Yu-Gi-Oh! 7s only to immediately use it as tribute fodder to summon Mega Zoller. So, looks like the cooler dinosaur normals of Legendary Collection 4 Joey's World wins again. But anime appearances aren't the only way Little D breaks the Wheeler's 9 mold. It's flavor text which reads, Yo, this Tyrannosaurus tots got a terrible tempo. Completely abandons the ah affixication of vowels plus r sounds when phonetically spelled out with Joey's pronunciations. Tyrannosaurus is understandable because Tyrannosaurus just doesn't sound right. Allowing us to extrapolate the turning the AR sounds into AH or AH doesn't work when the words contain additional vowel sounds, unlike in previous examples like HAD and HARD, or dinosaurs and dinosaurs. Perhaps if someone really wanted to find more to say about this card, they could explain the temper conundrum through cadence. That temper in little D's description when spoken aloud is not emphasized, indicated by the absence of the trademark wheeler AH but that would probably be stretching how much people care about Little D. On the other hand, if you're a fan of this dino, make some noise in the comments. He needs your support because Konami won't print him any. Matt Otoko is another card with Joey's voice, reading, This big ol' guy with the big ol' eye shoots a nasty ray beam right at ya. This big ol' guy is a level 2 earth beast with 700 attack and 600 defense, and bears an uncanny resemblance to the way more usable card, Hero Shadow Scout, which is not a beast, but a level 2 dark fiend with a flip effect, that causes your opponent to draw 3 cards and discard any spells they draw. A dubious contender for mill decks because even with a spell discard, just letting your opponent pick up 3 cards is risky business. Hero was actually limited for a time in Duel Links though, because of the lower minimum deck size of 20 cards. 
because Hero causes your opponent to actually draw cards they can deck out after the draw phase or even during your turn. Because if Hero flips and they have two or less cards, that's game. Meotoko has none of this ability. Allegedly, it can shoot a nasty rabium out of its eye, but apparently that doesn't translate into any strategic utility. A number of early monsters have otherwise unrelated companion cards with similar designs in different colors. So Meotoko isn't alone there. It's also not alone in having a very literal name. Like Kage Negan, Meotoko is just a romanization of a Japanese name meaning me, I, Otoko, Guy. What's interesting here is that Meotoko's name in the OCG is actually not Meotoko. Instead, in the OCG, this monster is called Babylon, written using katakana to indicate the name is imported into Japanese from a foreign origin. So why was Babylon censored during its journey from the OCG to the English TCG? We can speculate that it might be due to religious connotations. Cultural sensitivity to religious symbology was stronger in the United States than Japan, especially in the 2000s, and led to artwork censorship for many cards, Monster Reborn being a popular example. The religious significance of Babylon in the Western context is largely negative, with the two foremost examples being the legend of the Tower of Babel, where mankind sought to make themselves equal to God by building a giant tower to the heavens. God then caused the tongues of the tower's builders to splinter into many dialects. The interpretations of the meaning of this result are as numerous as the languages of the builders, but popular takeaways often revolve around the folly of man's intentions and how the cold realities of Earth can prevent us from an intimate understanding of heaven. Interestingly, there are other Yu-Gi-Oh cards that take inspiration from the Legend of Babel. The Continuous Trap, Tower of Babel, obviously, and the Field Spell, Orchestrated Babel, less obviously. Tower of Babel invokes the crumbling of previously reliable tools by adding a counter for every spell used and then penalizing the player to add a fourth counter by destroying the card and inflicting upon them 3,000 points of effect damage. Orchestrated Babel's relation to the Tower of Babel is more thematic, with Ningursu attempting to overthrow the cosmic force of destiny and revive his lost sister. But why did these cards make it through censorship but not Babylon? Well, most likely because they are direct references to the Tower of Babel story, while the full spelling of Babylon strays dangerously close to the Babylon of the Book of Revelations, an apocalyptic text depicting the end of the world. This book makes heavy use of symbols, and because of its often cryptic use of imagery to convey themes, it is famously tricky to decipher. In the text, Babylon is given as a name to further chisel meaning into a hallucinogenic avatar wickedness, which might explain the decision to censor. Meotoko slash Babylon actually isn't the only one-eyed Yu-Gi-Oh monster to undergo this bizarre censorship of having their natively foreign name turned into the romanization of a Japanese name upon translation into English. Hitotsumi Giant was the first monster to be used by Seto Kaiba in the anime, and you'd think its Japanese name would be something like Hitotsu 1 Me I Kyojin Giant, but that would be incorrect. In the OCG, this monster is called Saikurapuutsu, or Cyclops. Why was this censored? Hard to say. Maybe someone mistook the vocalization of the katakana as a psychopath instead of cyclops, since the words sound kind of similar. Who knows? At least Hitotsumi Giant and Meotoko can hang around and commiserate about being renamed after their lonely eyes. Like Anthrosaurus, Meotoko did appear in the anime during Yugi's deck analysis and as a discard from Yami Bakura's morphing jar. Why does Joey Wheeler have a Brooklyn accent anyway? Well, in the manga and Japanese anime, he speaks in a highly informal way without honorifics. A Brooklyn accent was chosen to convey his unpolished manner of speaking in the English dub. But why again? Well, this is going to be very general because this video is about Yu-Gi-Oh cards and not New York City. But New York is comprised of five boroughs. Brooklyn, Queens, State Island, the Bronx, and Manhattan. Historically, the highest degree of funding, infrastructure, and municipal support have been the privilege of Manhattan, where reside financial institutions like Wall Street and tourism drives like Times Square and Rockefeller Center. Compared to Manhattan, surrounding boroughs like Brooklyn had a higher demographic of diversity and were more representative of the working class, which is probably why the dialect was chosen for a scrappy underdog Joey Wheeler. Call it Brooklyn Class Rage. Anyways, this video is about Wheeler's 9, but right now we've only covered 6. So who's next? This guy, Hero of the East. He's a level 3 Earth Warrior with 1100 attack and 1000 defense making this hero officially the strongest of Wheeler's 9 that we've gotten to so far. Will he be the strongest? No, we're saving that for the end, so stick around. Anyway, Hero of the East, here it is. Field distrained a disword swinging samurai from the far east. Here we see the return of the familiar ah accent, this time applied to the sound that does not include an AR. Of becomes ah, like pronounced uh. Far and far east escapes the ah, possibly because far east is a proper noun, with immunity from contraction to distinguish in the vague concept of an eastern direction. Samurai also does not become Samurai, because the U and R aren't actually as connected as the English spelling of Samurai would have you think. 
The foundation of Japanese phonetics are five vowels, A, I, U, E, and O. Those core sounds can stand alone or come attached with a preceding vowel sound. For example, ka, ki, ku, ke, ko. So the word samurai is a combination of four sounds, sa, mu, ra, i, with the u in mu being separate from the r in ra. Anyway, Hero of the East bears the dubious distinction of appearing once in the Duel Monsters anime, but way after the other cards, except Little D, that we've talked about so far. This sword swinging samurai is seen in the nightmare experienced by Joey in episode 133. Struck comatose after an unfortunate loss to Merrick Ishtar's evil incarnation during the Battle City semifinals, where he actually would have won if not for the cold gnawing of shadows as they overwhelmed and consumed his soul, Joey slumbers fitfully, dreaming up a duel in which he loses to a random kid. In this dream duel, and never in his waking life on the show, Joey Wheeler summons Hero of the Far East. Hey look, another Joey card. Check out Wolf. That's right, not the Gene Ward War Wolf, or Diamond Dire Wolf, or Salmon Great Sunlight Wolf. Just Wolf. It's a wolf. And it's a level 3 Earth Beast with 1200 attack and 800 defense. So forget about Hero of the East. This normal, unspecial wolf chomps him and also Nightmare Mermaid, which is kind of embarrassing because that card has been banned for years in the TCG and in Duel Links. But, on the other hand, that's kind of a perfect evocation of the spirit of Joey Wheeler, who has got the determination and moxie to constantly upset more accomplished opponents. But there's actually bad news for Joey too. Let's check out the flavor text he provides. This alpha wolf uses his sense of smell to find an enemy. A hey, quit sniffing at my socks. Sounds like Wolf has found the enemy and he smells like Joey Wheeler's feet. It's Joey Wheeler. Good luck, friend. Interesting that of in this description becomes a instead of ah, indicating that the of in sense of smell is less emphasized than the of in strength ah this. In the anime, Wolf has one appearance and it has nothing to do with Joey Wheeler. In episode 147, Professor Arthur Hawkins explains to the gang the origin of dual monsters and how monsters' souls were sealed in physical mediums to be called in battle. During his flashback, we see Wolf. So what does Wolf have to do with Joey beyond maybe eating him per the descriptive text? Time to open a book. In The Siren, 69th chapter of the Yu-Gi-Oh manga, Joey prepares for his fight against Mai by looking through his deck to determine which terrain would yield him the most benefit. Briefly, Wolf is seen. Who is the final and strongest of Wheeler's Nine? It's also the monster used the most by Joey Wheeler in the anime, his trusty alligator sword. This creature is confusingly not a reptile, instead a level 4 earth beast with a decent but premium for this video stat line of 1500 attack and 1200 defense. Aye, this mighty lizard man can swing his sword so fast that it's more than the speed of sound. In a departure from the other cards in the set, Alligator Sword descriptive text does not begin with a capital letter, probably to emphasize its spoken nature. This card was actually made available in the TCG twice before Legendary Collection 4, Joey's World. So not only is it first in strength amongst Joey Wheeler's 9, it's also first. Alligator Sword is likely where Konami got the idea of expanding the Joey Wheeler Writes Monsters lines of cards. The Special World Championship 2010 card pack introduced Alligator Sword to the TCG and released alongside the fusion monster, Alligator Sword Dragon, which combines Alligator Sword with a fellow Joey staple, Baby Dragon, and was used by Joey against Mako Tsunami during the duel in the Domino City Aquarium. Alligator Sword was included again in 2012's Turbo Pack Booster 8, which had limited distribution in TCG tournaments, so although Alligator Sword predates Legendary Collection 4, the Joey World box was its first time made widely available. Starting in Battle City with his duel against Seeker, which he loses, Joey uses Alligator Sword more times than he uses Scapegoat. Tried and true, the stalwart staple of Wheeler's 9 won't desert you. Although, as Joey shows, it might not save you from losing your precious Red Eyes Black Dragon to a rare hunter. And that's the video! Next time you're planning on a meme deck, consider utilizing the Wheeler's 9 niche tech. It's not very good, but it is very fun and cool. Strong monsters, weak monsters, that is only the selfish perception of people. Truly skilled duelists should try to win with their favorites. That's from a different franchise, but it's as good as reasons to use Joey Wheeler's 9.